Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Deep Dive into StockCharts.com with your host, me, Chip Anderson. I'm the president of StockCharts.com. Uh, and I want to really, in, during this show, dive deep into specific topics. And this week's topic is one of my favorites, point and figure charting. So let's get into it. I've got my good friend Rachel here with me. We're in the uh, Stock Charts Cafe, by the way, this, the, uh, and the place in our office where we, we go to have lunch. We thought we'd shoot from here uh, instead of just our regular studio. Uh, and Rachel's here. She's going to be taking your questions. This is a live show, and I really want to hear from you. If you've got questions or, or on the topic at hand, uh, we'd absolutely love to. Uh, you can just enter them into that little chat window next to the, uh, the, the Stock Charge TV video, uh, and we'll try and get them answered while we're during the show. Again, uh, this week's featured uh, feature is uh, point and figure charting. And... It's one of my favorites. I've got some, uh, some books and other things I want to show you here in just a minute. But um, the, the key thing with point and figure charting, point and figure charting is the charts where you have the X's and the O's on graph paper. And the key thing to remember, as, as I've got in the slide here, is it's a rising column of X's and a falling column of O's. So as stock prices increase, you're going to be in a column of X's going up until stocks uh, reverse, and we'll talk about that in just a second, and they go down, and they keep going down in a, in a falling column of O's. And so they'll do that over time, uh, and that's how the chart evolves. One of the interesting things about PNF charts, we'll, and we'll see this uh, again in just a minute, is that they are not uh, linear in time, meaning that on a normal bar chart, um, every single day or every single period, every single hour, minute, or whatever the chart is, uh, takes up a fixed amount of time, a, a, and that's the identically equal amount of time each time. So the horizontal scale is linear and, and um, very consistent. On a PNF chart, uh, the horizontal scale only increases when another column gets added to the chart. Columns only get added as volatility of the stock requires it. And so uh, it could be that a, a PNF chart might go uh, many days or weeks or even months. Uh, before adding another column. And so the, the, what you end up with is a, is a horizontal time axis at the bottom of a PNF chart that is not linear, that's kind of uh, starts and stops with, with uh, lots of uh, adds and subtracts and different, different amounts of time as it goes. So we want to keep an eye out for that as we go ahead. Anyway, so point and figure charts, just a brief history of these things. And, and they, have a, they actually have a longer history. They've been around much longer than the standard bar charts that you might be familiar with. And uh, the candlestick charts, well, they were in Japan from a long time ago. But in terms of the candlestick charts and modern charting, um, the P&F charts predate those as well. Uh, they became popular in the 1920s. And in that time, of course, there weren't any computers. And of course, there weren't any displays. People had to keep charts by hand, especially uh, if you were just an average investor. Uh, and all you had at the time, uh, back in those early days, was a newspaper that would come out once a day and give you the closing price for each stock. So that's all you had. That was your, there was no CNBC. There was no StockChurch.com. There was nothing. That was it. And so the question was, how can we take all these numbers that are coming out in the newspaper and turn them into something graphical, something we can follow? And the other thing was, how can we do it for a large number of stocks where we are not having to redraw the chart completely every day. And the way you do it is you get a piece of graph paper and you would start putting in these dots when, whenever the stock was going down or whenever it was going up. Those were called uh, the points. And initially they were point charts. Uh, and then they started becoming X's and O's and that was the point and figure charts. There's several books that I have that I'll show you in a second that, that go into the history in much more detail than this. But the bottom line is, you can update a PNF chart by on a piece of graph paper simply by pulling out yesterday's graph paper or the, the the chart that you had and just adding more dots to it. Until you ran out of graph paper, you did not need to redraw the chart, and that was really really nice and convenient. People would just have stacks of graph paper, however many, 10, 15, 20, 100, whatever, and then every day they'd look at the newspaper, and based on the number that they'd see for each stock, they would update the graph paper for that stock, maybe by just adding one or two little marks on it, and then they'd flip and go to the next one. It was really, really quick to be able to, to um, update your charts using just that newspaper information. So it was really, really popular back in the days before people had um, computers and other things to make these charts easier. 
Um, but uh, very popular in the 20s and, and, and so forth. And again, just works great. Uh, the first modern PNF proponent was um, somebody named Abe Cohen, who worked with Chartcraft uh, back in 1968. Actually, let's see. Well, we'll start earlier than that. I've got a book here called um, The Point and Figure Method of Anticipating Stock Price Movements. It's the only method based on logical and scientific mechanical principles by Victor de Villiers and Owen Taylor. And this is the book. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but it is a, um, <coughs> you might could, I don't know if you can see this either, but it's, it's typewritten. It's uh, created on a typewriter uh, and then just copied and copied. The charts themselves are fairly um, handwritten. Here is, um, here's some examples of the charts that are in the back of this thing. Uh, really gives you a sense of uh, the, the early days of point and figure charts. And obviously they kind of went over top over the top on the title. But this was a very popular and influential book. Uh, it, the copyright, by the way, on these charts is copyrighted 1933 uh, in New York City. So that's how old these charts have been around. Uh, again, the next guy up was Abe Cohen, who kind of repopularized um, point and figure charting via the Chartcraft um, gr group. And here is um, well some of, some of his stuff in a couple other different book forms uh, became available. Other books. And then, continuing on, because I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do like my books. Uh, one of the most popular books in recent times, starting in 95 and then continuing on, is Tom Dorsey's book. And Tom is uh, still very, very popular on the speaking circuit. He, he has a great website. Uh, the book is really good, talking a lot about point figure charting and specifically also about the bullish percent indexes, which we will get into in just a little bit. He's recently updated the book. We sell it in our bookstore. It's published by Wiley. Really good book. And then the final book that recently came out is, is amazing. This is the book I really enjoy. Uh, Jeremy Duplessis' book, The Definitive Guide to Point and Figure Charting. Um, and uh, it is, I don't know about definitive, but it is extremely detailed, that's for sure. And he goes into a whole lot of detail on the history of point and figure charting, the different kinds of point and figure charts, and the different kinds of um, ways to an analyze point and figure charts. If you want to go above and beyond what we're going to talk about today, if you really want to go deep, uh, the, de the Definitive Guide to Point and Figure Charting by Jeremy Duplessis is the way to go. So anyway, those are some great books. We've got them in our bookstore as well. Um, also, of course, we have our chart school area on our website where we've kind of summarized a lot of the information in these books, made that available to you really quickly. Okay. So now let's, let's conceptually get into point figure charting. What exactly are they showing us and how can we think about them? Especially if we're coming at them from the direction we are where we have uh, a lot of experience safe with um, bar charts and candlestick charts and trend lines and, and all the standard kind of charting capability that, that's available out there on the internet and on stock charts. Where does this point figure stuff fit in to that? And so I like to think about it as, as a, one of these kind of telescoping uh, lamps. Maybe you've seen these, maybe you have one or not, which, whatever. These are the lamps that they, they go out and then they come back. So you, the, you, you're familiar with this, kind of this telescoping capability. And what's interesting is to look at the bars that make up the, the scissor kind of action on these, uh, on these charts. So, so the bars here, when it's extended, the bars are slanted. They're kind of in a, verti um, a, a 45 degree angle to the ground. But when they were collapsed, you might have noticed those same bars would change and become more or less vertical. They'd be going uh, 90 degrees to the ground. And so that's kind of what a point and figure chart is all about. It's about taking a bar chart where the prices are kind of at an angle and then collapsing it so that those, those trend lines that are at an angle become vertical. Listen, and so what, I'm, what do I mean? See that bar there? As we then collapse the, uh, the lamp, then that bar will become vertical. It, 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 it's the same bar, it's just at a different angle, and it's all collapsed and, and compressed. Uh, and so the same thing happens with charts. Here is a regular kind of bar chart, line chart, with um, a particular uh, fixed set uh, on the horizontal axis. The time uh, elements on this horizontal axis are all equal, like I said at the beginning like bar and candlestick charts have. And we could create some trend lines on this chart, or I can simply have a, that's a zigzag indicator coming in to kind of draw kind of automatic trend lines on this chart, just to kind of show you the ups and the downs. Now, here's the thing. That is the expanded version. 
a PNF chart is kind of like the collapsed version of that, just like the the the, the light collapsed when you when you moved it backwards. So so this is the expanded version, and this is the collapsed version. All right, and so if we go back, and now let's pick one of these trend lines. Let's pick this trend line right here, okay? So it's at a 45 degree angle, more or less, somewhere in there. So it's on a slanted angle. And then it becomes that vertical set of O's, in this case, because it's a downtrend, uh, there on the PNF chart. So it was um, angled and now it's vertical. And that's, that's what happens with a PNF chart. Hopefully that helps you kind of understand the relationship between the two different kinds of charts. Um, I'll go into the details of exactly how we draw these charts in just a second, but that's, that's conceptually what you want to keep in your mind is, is this um, slanting going to horizontal and vertical, that kind of thing. All right, okay. So one of the really interesting things, and I think the important things about PNF charts is they are actually really easy to interpret because they actually have already done a lot of filtering for you. A PNF chart, and the way that it's constructed, we'll get into that in a second, but what's important to remember is it will automatically eliminate all of the insignificant price movements. Uh, if there's something where the price just does a little bit, a little bobble, um, that won't show up in a PNF chart typically. Um, you can change it so it would, but usually what you're doing is you're, you're going to set some settings and the PNF charts then are going to automatically filter out stuff that you're not interested in. And what does that mean? It means that every movement on a PNF chart is significant. Now that's something that we're not, you, you might not be used to. If you've been looking at bar charts for a while, you kind of develop a, your own kind of mental filter. You'll automatically start to ignore little, little blips on the chart and that kind of thing. You'll automatically kind of even subconsciously start to do some filtering when you look at a chart. With a PNF chart, it's not the same deal. Filtering's already happened. So you, every single movement on a PNF chart can be significant. And so, and as I mentioned, um, columns are added when there is a significant change in price, meaning there's a significant change in the trend. So very important. Each column is important in a PNF chart. Now you get to define, as I said, you get to define what significant means. So, so how much prices have to move before a new column is added, so on and so forth. So the amount of filtering that goes on is up to you, but the point is that filtering does occur. Um, the two things you get to set are the reversal mount and the box size. We'll see that in just a second. But the bottom line is every movement on a PNF chart can be significant. And so unlike a bar chart, you want to pay attention to everything. So let's go and do a quick demo. I just want to show you how, uh, what PNF charts look like on stock charts and how you can create them. So here we go. We are on stockcharts.com right now, and I'm going to start by just showing you a chart of Boeing, and then I'm going to show you how I created it. Here's Boeing. Here's Boeing's PNF chart, and um, it has two settings. The settings are re referred to up here. The first off is we are using traditional scaling, and the second thing is we're using a reversal amount of three. And I'll, I'll get into more of those and what the different options are here in just a minute. But this is a typical traditional PNF chart of Boeing with a reversal amount of three. And you can see the price is going up and down. And you can also see we've automatically added some trend lines to the chart. I'll talk about how those get added in just a second too. But we see the ups and the downs of the X's and the O's. So what we can see here is in the beginning of, 19, of 2019, um, Boeing entered a pretty bearish phase where it it broke out of what it was doing before and started moving higher. And X's were added to this chart and they were just added and added and added as Boeing continued to move higher. And at a certain point, um, it got high enough and then the prices reversed. They reversed enough that we could add three descending O's. And when I talk about this, uh, the reversal amount is three. That means that we'll never reverse unless we can add at least three O's. So in that case, that, that happened. And then immediately, Boeing reversed again and started heading higher again. It continued its move up until the, uh, until the beginning of March. So the question has probably been asked, uh, <laughs> what are these numbers? I've got X's, I've got O's, and now I have these numbers. What the heck are these? The numbers represent the first day of the month that that chart had a new X or O added to it. So in this case, we were going up back in January with Boeing, and then we hit February, February 1st. 
On February 1st, this box was filled in. A couple other boxes might have been filled in too, I'm not really sure, but at least this box was filled in on February 1st. So that's why it has a two in it. And then after a little um, a reversal and reverse again, it moved higher. This box was filled in on March 1st or the first, the first trading day of March. And so that's, that's nice to know. Um, and so you'll see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you'll see A, which is October, and B, which is November. And eventually, we'll have a C on here, which is December. So it'll, that, those will represent the, uh, the 12 months of the year. That's what the numbers and letters are. Anyway, and so you can see Boeing then reversed, and it did go back down for a while. And then it went sideways with some volatility up and down. And you can see the distance between, in this case, between four and five was two columns, three columns, essentially. But the distance between five and six was, set, was um, five columns, and so on and so forth. So again, columns are only added as volatility uh, demands them to be added. And sometimes they'll be, the months will be very, very close together, and sometimes they'll be very far apart. So what we're left with is right now this chart is Boeing is in a rise in column of X's. However, the price has fallen to 351, and which is right at the edge of being of reversing. If it falls much further, then it will reverse into a falling column of O's. But at this point, it's only reversed two boxes down and therefore not quite enough for us to add another column of O's. Now, how do you create these things? Let's go back to the dashboard. We'll start, start at the beginning. So you've logged into your account. Here's the stock charts dashboard. And we want to create a P and F chart. A couple ways we can do it, but the easiest way is to use the drop down on the chart bar up here. Click on P and F chart and type in the ticker symbol you're interested in. And again, in this case, we, we would just use Boeing. Keep using Boeing. And there it is. Boom. I've come up with my particular chart. Now, these are my chart settings, and I can save those. I'll show you what they are down here. I have made the size 1,000. There are a lot of different sizes you want to choose. And again, my advice is to choose the largest size you can get away with on your screen. Um, I'm using a high-low, meaning I'm looking at the highs and the lows for Boeing, not just the closing values, which I could choose if I wanted, a little less volatility. I'm also using an end date of today on the chart. So that's the most up-to-date version of the Boeing chart. Um, and I am using down here in chart scaling, as I mentioned, I'm using traditional and I'm using three as my reversal. Got several other choices for scaling. This might be the most important drop down on the, on the page. Traditional percentage dynamic using the ATR indicator and user defined. We're going to go over each of those here in just a minute. And then I also have the ability to add some overlays. The only real, not a lot of overlays are here. There are some uh, moving averages and things that are kind of interesting. But the most interesting one, I think, is trend lines. Those are kind of turned on automatically. And you can see them here, the, B, the blue and the red lines. We'll talk about those, too. But anyway, those, um, you can change the symbol up here. Uh, you, you can have different periods. I recommend strongly that you work with daily charts. Daily is, is what PNF is, its history is. But you can... It, Experiment with and learn more uh, and try and see if you can define patterns in some of the other periods that are out there. And you have the ability to save your point and figure charts into your chart list using the standard interface. Very similar to what we're used to with sharp charts. So that's what we call the PNF Workbench. Just a quick overview of that. Uh, there are some interesting capabilities that we have. For instance, we have, um, I think it's uh, going to go with automatic. Was that it? Yeah, we've got the... Uh, the sunset color scheme makes a return here. We can change color schemes, other kinds of things if you want to go crazy. But PNF really kind of demands, I think, the, um, the graph paper look. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. I will say, though, one thing, and we do this. Other sites don't. You want to, be, you want to pay attention to this. PNF really demands that the boxes be square, that they be boxes. Uh, if you see a site with PNF charts where the boxes are rectangles and the X's are squished, or the O's are squished, and, and they're not, they're very strange looking rectangles. They're not even close to being uh, boxes uh, with equal sides. Uh, run and run screaming because you really need boxes in order to do PNF chart, charting correctly. And I'll, I'll show you why here in just a second. But anyway, um, so that's the overview of the PNF chart. And hopefully that's 
That's good enough. We, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm going to go back to my slides. And let's talk a little bit more about those settings that I just went over. Uh, again, the, there are two things. One is the scaling uh, method, and the other is the reversal amount. So let's talk about reversal mounts first. And because uh, reversal mounts are, are the easiest. Um, but so there was a very, com <laughs> this is a bit of a joke. There was a very complex formula handed down many years and handed down over the centuries with, uh, between the P&F wizards as to what you should use for the reversal mount. It's very, very complex, very hard to remember. Are you ready for it? Here it is. Use three. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> you can use other, other versions. You're, you're welcome to change that and see what you come up with. But in terms of what everybody uses and what everybody looks at, it's, it's almost universally three for the reversal amount. Uh, it's gonna, that's a very nice number. It's going to make sure that your chart isn't too volatile and jumpy all over the place. And so it is doing some of that filtering I was mentioning, but it also means that your chart isn't, it is going to uh, update. It's going to have an interesting number of moves. It's going to give you an interesting amount of information. Three works really, really well. So that was for the reversal amount. Now, the box size, the box scaling, you do have a couple of really interesting choices, and there's a bit of a controversy and, and personal preferences come into play on this. So this is the one you play, maybe play with a little more. There is the tr what's called the traditional box size. This was the size that was originally um, promoted uh, way back in the early days of point and figure charting. Um, and basically, it's a table. There's a table. It's, you can see it in our chart school. If prices are between or within this particular range, then a box should be this, this particular size. Um, pretty small, the boxes are going to um, be small size. But as the prices grow, then the box sizes grow. So, so initially a box might represent, say, 10 cents. But then as, and, and that might be, I can't remember, but that might be the, the size when you are, say, below $10 in price. But as you move above $10 in price, then suddenly your box size becomes 50 cents. And so that's important to know because it means that your patterns and your P&F um, uh, chart will start to compress as the prices get higher and higher and higher. And that may or may not be good for you. It also means there can be significant changes right at these boundaries but, uh, in, the, in this traditional table. So keep that, keep that in mind as you're looking at traditional. Generally, though, it's a good thing to start with. If you're confused and you have absolutely no idea what um, box size to use, traditional usually won't lead you wrong. And so usually it's a pretty good starting point. Now, later when computers came on the scenes, people said, hey, this traditional stuff does have some drawbacks. We need to come up with a better approach that's going to work in a lot of circumstances. And so that's where the percentage scaling came around. Computers can calculate these things. What it means is that each box represents a constant percentage of price, not, the, not an absolute value of price, but the constant percentage of price. And so each box is a little, contains a little bigger amount of information than the previous box, so on and so forth. It makes for a very consistent chart as you go up and down and, and if, if you have wide price swings and that kind of thing. But it um, is a little hard to compute and the box um, boundaries are going to be really weird numbers. They're not going to be nice round numbers, which you might you might prefer. The traditional will give you nice round numbers all the time. So that's what's going on there. Now, um, even more, of course, uh, us being computer programmers and technicians and chartists, we like, to we like to make things even more complex. And so somebody somewhere said, hey, instead of percentage, fixed percentage, let's use ATR, which is a great indicator that measures volatility. And so as a chart gets more volatile, then uh, the ATR will automatically kind of smooth out the box size and make the box size more interesting. Um, we, stock charts here, we decided that's a little too wonky, so we're just going to call this automatic scaling. It is done using the ATR indicator. But what happens is, uh, the, the way the calculation works is, no matter what your chart, what the stock's price is doing, you're going to get an interesting chart. By interesting, I mean you're going to have some uh, ups and downs. You're going to have enough ups and downs that you'll get an interesting number of, of X, column of X's and column of O's and column of X's and column of O's. Your chart isn't going to be really dull in that regard. So that, that's a nice thing because a lot of times when you're looking at a chart, you do want to see 
an interesting chart, not, not just a chart with one or two columns on it. Um, but the downside of this ATR calculation capability is it can change from day to day. So today, maybe the ATR calculated the box size should be 10, but tomorrow, because of some the price movements tomorrow, it may calculate the box size should be 12. That's going to completely change the chart. It's going to not just change today's part of the chart, it's going to change all of the chart. And so you have to understand that dynamic ATR, when you're comparing it from day to day to day, it can vary wildly in terms of what you're actually seeing on the chart. A lot of times what we recommend doing if you don't want that to happen is you create a dynamic chart and then off the top of the chart you read what box size it shows. Let's say it shows 10. But it, then what you want to do is you want to fix it so that it's always 10 and doesn't change. And in order to do that, you're going to change from an, a dynamic or automatic chart to a user-defined chart. You're going to, and then you're going to type in 10. The ATR chart would have told you 10 is a good thing to have. So now you go and you create a user-defined chart. You type in 10 there, hit save, and now that chart won't change. Um, regardless of what happens in the next couple of days. So that's how you can have a chart initially created on, on automatic settings, but now fixed in, in time, and, and therefore you can watch it evolve over time. So that's what a user, user defined means that you get to set what the box size is. You can set it to any number that you want to set it to, um, and that will, that will affect the chart. Obviously, um, you want to set it to a size that is similar to the price around the time that you're looking at it but it's still something you can experiment with. And you will see, as you set the box numbers smaller, you'll get lots and lo a much, much bigger chart. As you set the box size higher, you'll get a smaller and smaller chart until at some point, the box size will be so high that it'll simply be a one box chart, which isn't too interesting. Anyway, again, my recommendation, or, or uh, I should say, there are many recommendations from different PNF experts. And for instance, Tom Dorsey, very much a fan of the traditional scaling size. Jeremy Duplessis, on the other hand, very much a fan of the percentage-based um, scaling. He also likes the ATR approach. Uh, my thing, for the reasons I just talked about a second ago, is avoid ATR because it can cause the chart to change dramatically from, uh, from time to time. That's my opinion. Anyway, uh, so that's Chip, where things are. Uh, before we get too far, I wanted to know if you're open to a couple questions. Absolutely. Okay. Fire away. Okay, so the first one... Um, is Richard, he asks, why is there no A for October in the PNF chart for the INDU symbol? It just jumps from 9 to B. Hmm. Well, so in order for there to be a letter or number for the month, it means that there has to have been a change in the chart during that month. Now, I haven't looked at the INDU chart recently to be sure of this, but my strong suspicion here in this case is for those particular settings that you're looking at, Richard, um, there was not enough volatility during the month for new X's or new O's to be added to the chart. And so the chart just went directly from 9 to B. It's only going to be able to add the A if there was boxes filled during that month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe one more question. Um, some people put projection lines on the PNF chart. What is the tool for that? Projection lines. So like trend lines continuing off into the, uh, off into the future. Um, they're probably doing that with, with an alternate tool that's available. Uh, it's these, uh, I'll talk in just a minute about PNF trend lines. I literally will talk about them next. Okay. Um, and they're very easy to create. And so it's very easy to create those projections. So, um, it, so if there's nothing else, let's do, let's do that. Let's talk about PNF trend lines because I think they're really cool. Um, there's what they look like on the screen there. And... Um, how are they drawn? Well, first off, and this is why it's super important that you're, you use square boxes on your PNF charts. These trend lines are always drawn at 45 degrees. There's no other angle at which uh, a, a valid PNF trend line should be drawn. They're always drawn at 45 degrees. It makes them very easy to calculate and position. Um, another thing that's important to remember about these trend lines is they're actually not trend lines in, that, in the classic sense. Uh, you have to remember, we've already compressed this chart. We've already seen how each column is actually a trend line on a regular chart. Remember that lamp? So what that means is that a PNF trend line is actually a trend of trends, which is a much different beast. It's, I think, very significant. 
If you find a trend line on a PNF chart that's getting touched a couple of times, that's again a trend of trends. You've already filtered out all of the insignificant price movements, and you should pay attention to that. So, how do you create them? It's very easy. You find a significant peak or trough on your chart, and every time there's a significant peak or trough, um, there will be kind of a little 45 degree angle that you'll be able to quickly draw from, and you keep drawing up or down until you hit another um, box that's been filled, um, which will happen either immediately or it'll happen a, a long time from now. We will automatically add PNF chart lines or trend lines to your, your charts uh, if you have that turned on. We will stop at the most recent thing, but it's very easy just to continue on because it's, as I mentioned, it's just at 45 degrees. So you would just continue to fill in those boxes with that trend line uh, going up or, or down, depending. So very, very easy to create PNF trend lines. That's a, that's a great advantage. Compare that to um, doing it with regular bar and candlestick charts. Uh, a trend line is in the eye of the beholder many times on those charts. And where one person might put a trend line, another person might choose not to do that. On a PNF chart, it's much less subjective. It's much more objective. Really, really uh, nice that way. And then, of course, if you've got trend lines, that means that you have chart patterns. You have to you have to work on them a little bit, but they're there. And a really nice thing about PNF charts, possibly the best thing about PNF charts, is the price patterns on PNF charts, of which there are many, are objective. They're not subjective. I mean, I mentioned just a second ago that on bar and candlestick charts, trend lines are hard to get agreement on. Well, price patterns are really hard to get agreement on. Uh, one person will always see head and shoulder patterns everywhere. Another person will always see uh, double tops everywhere, so on and so forth. Um, in a PNF chart, the, these patterns are objective. They're well-defined. There's really no room for argument on them. They exist or they don't exist very clearly. Another thing uh, that allows them to be found by computers because they're so um, uh, well-defined, and of course we do find PNF patterns and we'll point them out to you automatically, Something else to keep in mind, just like trend lines on a PNF chart are trends of trends, chart patterns on a PNF chart are patterns of trends, and that and trends after filtering out insignificant movements. And that in itself is also super useful. It can help you uh, quickly get rid of the noise and focus on what, it, what is the chart really telling you. So the fact that they're patterns of trends I think is super important. So here's some examples of PNF uh, patterns, and there are many more. We have them all documented in our chart school area. Um, but for example, there's an ascending triple top. What does that mean? Well, what that means is, let's see if I can get my mouse going. Whoops, oh, maybe I can't. All right, um, but what it means is there are three X's. If you look at uh, the line that's three from the top, you'll see an X, and then a little further over, you'll see another X below and then you'll see the final X, which is two below. So there was, that would be a triple top if they were all aligned horizontally. But instead, in addition to being aligned like that, they're also increasing each time. So the first X is, at the, is the lowest, and the next X is one above that. And the final X in the final column where it says ascending triple top breakout, that's at the top. So this is kind of a 45-degree a angle of a, triple, of a top. It's a top that's been angled at 45 degrees. And therefore, that's what they mean by ascending triple top breakout. And actually, prior to the triple top appearing, uh, you notice there's also a label there that says double top. So it, it had to make a double top before it could make a triple top. And that's what that indicates. The uh, triple bottom is the same exact thing. That's a, a regular triple bottom in that diagram. Uh, there's no descending aspect to it. It's all, it's all horizontal. And so you see three O's that kind of matched up. And then at the, at the very last column there, it says triple bottom. And then it says triple bottom breakdown. And that's where another O was added below the level of the previous O's. And therefore, that support level, as you, if you want, was broken. And that's the breakdown that happened. Um, but it's very clear on the chart. Um, there are other ones here. We got bull traps and catapults and double bottom breakdowns. They, they have a very um, uh, rich, <laughs> uh, descriptive uh, language as to how they're described. Again, it's all in chart school. 
Um, and you can check that out. Now, in addition, though, in, to Chart School, we also, we, Stock Charts, will automatically every day calculate how many stocks have each of these standard PNF patterns. And these standard patterns, uh, we publish a table, and you can see how many charts have this have uh, bullish patterns and how many charts have bearish patterns. There they are. You can click on the numbers to get those. So let's take half a second on, uh, on my other computer here, and we're going to go over to um, the uh, predefined PNF uh, patterns. You can find them either on the dashboard or you can find them here on the charts and tools area. I'm going to go to, in this case, I'll go to charts and tools. I'll scroll down until I find the um, predefined uh, technical scans. Where did that go? Um, do my, they're not jumping out at me. <laughs> I should have checked this earlier. I'm going to go, all right, I'm going to do this then. I'm going to go to your dashboard. This is what I'm more used to. And I'm going to scroll down here on the right. And I'm going to find them because they're here somewhere. Predefined scans. There they are. Reports and more. Predefined scans. That's what we're looking for. And here are all of our predefined scans. We have a lot of them here, including uh, various uh, candlestick and other kinds of patterns. But what we're looking for is down here, PNF patterns. See where it says PNF patterns here? This is the thing that I was talking to you about. So all of the double top breakouts and the triple top breakouts, so on and so forth, are listed here. And we can click on any of these numbers if we want to see, for instance, all of the PNF bear traps in the NYSE or the NASDAQ. We can click right here to see those stocks. So that's pretty, so I'm going to click here on 11, and then I'm going to click on, oh, I don't know, let's pick one. Um, we'll pick uh, In Steel Industries, and I'm going to click on the little X and O icon. And now we see that particular stock, and it has the bear trap here. There we go. The bear trap happened on October 18th in this case. And that was the latest, uh, most interesting PNF pattern that we found on the chart. So that's why we list it at the top. All right, but just remember, it's the predefined scan results on the members dashboard where you can find those things. And they're hidden somewhere on the free charts page too. All right, I've already done this demo. Good for me. <laughs> that makes things easier. All right, let's talk now about another topic that a lot of people are very interested in. Uh, and some people will misconstrue, so you have to be cautious here. They're called PNF price objectives. PNF price objectives are price targets for the current PNF move, and they're based on the distance between the most recent PNF buy signal and PNF sell signal. PNF buy signals and sell signals, by the way, are a little mis the names are a little misleading. They're extremely simplistic symbols. They just mean that one column moved a, um, higher than the previous column, or one column move lower than the previous column. So they're, to call it a buy and a sell signal and say that those are definitive places where you should buy or sell, a stock is, is, not, is misleading. They're extremely simple systems. They're kind of like bullish or bearish signals. In fact, I think those would be better, better names for them. Anyway, um, but you can use the distance, the horizontal distance between PNF buy and sell signals in order to come up with what they call the PNF price objective. Um, the problem is, of course, like everything else in uh, the stock market, is there's no guarantees here. This is not an easy way to make a zillion dollars. Um, if it was, everybody would do it. Uh, they are not 100% accurate. I wouldn't even say they are, they're very accurate at all. They are, they are an interesting gauge. Um, in many ways, they are kind of a historical artifact. If you read these older books like I was showing you earlier, you'll see where that information kind of got, um, came from and who came up with it. Uh, but that was back in the days before computers and, and they were very those numbers were very interesting at the time. I don't think they're very accurate at all anymore in today's market. Uh, I will say they're very, very popular and so, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, and if you fully understand how they're calculated and you think that how they're calculated is a useful approach, then they can be very useful to you. But I will, again, I will caution you, you really want to understand how they're calculated before you use them. Um, a lot of people, we see this all the time on social media, will put up one of our PNF charts and they'll say, look, stock charts projects that this stock is going to 100. 
No, we don't. Mm. <laughs> We're not doing that. We did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's um so so that's that's very misleading. And that's that's why I'm I'm just trying to be overly cautious on these things. Uh, if you understand how they work, great, go for it. Um, and by the way, you can learn a lot more about them by going to this URL. I've actually created a little short special URL for you guys so you can get to that to the article really quickly. Go to stockcharts.com slash price dash objectives. And that will take you right to the Chart School article. You can learn a lot more about those things right then and there and then decide if, 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 if they're the great or if, if Chip's full of it or whatever. That's fine, whatever. All right. So, um, any other questions at this point, Rachel? Yes. Hold on just a second. <laughs> okay. She's going to pull them up. I've caught I've, her off guard. I've, I've got a couple things going on here uh, with uh, people in private. Yes, we do. Um, so, Titus. No, actually, I'm sorry. Let's let's get to the the most frequently asked question right now, which is, when are we going to be able to annotate PNF charts? When are we going to be able to annotate PNF charts? PNF chart annotation is on our list of things that we'd like to provide. Um, I got to say, it's not at the top of the list. Um, the ability to annotate PNF charts is limited because, again, the lines that you can create on a PNF chart are typically either going to be at 45 degrees or horizontally. And so anything above and beyond that is going to, in terms of um, curves or other kinds of things, is probably going to not really fit the PNF model. So for that reason, we have kept PNF uh, annotations kind of on the back burner because we think it'd be relatively simplistic. The only thing that would be super great would be the ability to type text on your PNF chart so you can put little notes to yourself and stuff like that. We hear you. We agree that that's an important thing. Uh, we're a little busy with some other stuff right now, but so I'm not really sure when that's going to happen. Okay. And if you have time for one more question from Sarah, are intraday PNF charts useful? So intraday PNF charts are interesting. <laughs> so I'll use that. Um, they are available to members and you can get down to as little as a single minute period. Um, the problem is, well, it's not a problem, but it's just that the, the, the thing that causes those to be different is that a PNF chart really needs time to evolve. Um, like I said, it's, some PNF charts will spend a long time in an uptrend or a downtrend column before they move on to the next column. And if you're doing something like a one minute PNF chart, typically you're going to get a lot of columns that are really short. That's not always true, but it's often true. Um, because there's so much volatility in a one minute chart uh, relative to all the other price movements that are going on on a one minute chart, um, you'll just end up with a lot of really short columns of X's and O's that are reversing a lot. I encourage you to check it out, try it, see what you think. If you're a, a a trader that's trading short-term time frames and you you want something new to kind of give you ideas for when to buy and when to sell, a PNF chart could be a really great approach. Um, but in terms of the longer-term investor kind of mindset or somebody who really wants to see PNF patterns evolve, you're going to need a longer time period, uh, an hour at least, and I would really go daily. I, daily is still kind of the the home of PNF. It's it's where it, it evolved, and, and that's really where you want to stay. Okay. Uh, one more question. Sure. Um, since we're on the subject of patterns, can more than one PNF pattern be valid at the same time? That's a great question, and we get that a bunch in feedback. The answer is yes, absolutely yes. It's very possible that several patterns will be valid at the same time, but we will only show, this is what's important on the PNF chart itself, we will only show the most complex pattern that is valid at the time, and, and that's there's a little bit of subjectivity to that. We've got a, a table that says this pattern is more complex than that pattern, so on and so forth. So if the pattern, for instance, takes um, five columns to, to create, we're gonna, and the, another pattern that's valid only takes two columns to evolve, we're gonna show the five pattern, col uh, pattern, the five column pattern on the chart at the top. Just because it's at the top doesn't mean it's, that there aren't other patterns that are valid. So let's keep that in mind. Now, another great thing about point figure charts is they can be used as the basis for market indicators and sentiment indicators. And I think they're really powerful sentiment indicators that come out of this. Remember, it's very easy for computers to create a PNF chart and then look at that chart to determine 
the bullishness or the bearishness of the chart. And so um, we came up, somebody came up with the idea of the bullish percent index a long time ago. And I think it's a very powerful index. Their market indicators calculated by automatically analyzing large groups of PNF charts. And they are great strength indicators that show conclusively if that group is getting stronger or weaker. And they're based on, a, on that very simple pattern I mentioned a minute ago, just the PNF buy signal or the, the bullish signal where it's moved above the previous one. So here's what the, the buy signal looks like. So let's say we're in this stock and the stock is, is moving higher. It's in, a, it's, in a, it's in an uptrend, so therefore it's in a rising column of X's. And it gets up to this point, but then suddenly it fades. It doesn't have any more momentum and it starts to reverse. And so let's say it goes down enough so that we can put three O's in the next column. That's what we do when there's a new downtrend in place. But then it immediately turns around and comes right back up. So boom, there we go. Now it's in the uptrend again. And in that uptrend, as, when it gets to the level the, of the previous column of X's, and then it goes above that level, that's a PNF buy signal. So again, it's a pretty simple signal, but it is, it's clearly bullish. The stock has gotten higher than it had in the previous uptrend. So that's really nice. So the question then becomes, okay, how many stocks in a group, and a group could be like the entire New York Stock Exchange or the entire NASDAQ, or it could be a smaller group, how many of those stocks are in, have a buy signal? And so we do this. Every day we do this. Other people do it. But, but stock charts is one of the things we do is for all the different groups, we will go and calculate all the different PNF buy signals, and we will then count them up. So let's say, for instance, this was our group that we were interested in. And so in this case, we found 66%, 66.6% of those stocks that we looked at uh, were in a P, had a PNF buy signal on their chart. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that number, 66.6, and we're going to store it into our market indicator, into our special um, ticker symbol that we use to track this stuff uh, for this particular day, day number one. Then we're going to do the same thing again for day number two. And let's say we got 75 in that case. And we're going to store that in our database. And then we do it again for the next day. And let's say we got 83.3%, so on and so forth. You just keep doing this day after day after day after day. And you build up a data set. And eventually, you end up with something that you can chart. You can chart all those numbers. So the numbers are going to get our percentage. And they're going to go between 0 and 100. But they're going to give you an, an indication during these different periods of time as to how strong that group was. Now, the godfather or the grandfather of all um, uh, bullish percent index uh, charts is the NYSE bullish percent index. It's been tracked for a very long time and is talked about quite heavily. And you can see here's our chart of the NYSE bullish percent index. The symbol is dollar BP NYA. Now, the chart I'm showing you is actually a little old, but if you put that into the current version of stock charts, you will see uh, the most recent version of this thing. It's typically charted as a line because it only has one value per day. And it's typically, again, it should be charted in a way such that um, it goes between 0 and 100. And obviously, 50 is an interesting um, level. If it goes above or below 50, that could be an overall bullish or bearish signal for the market. And obviously, if it goes above 70 or below 30, that could be an additional signal. Uh, and readings below 20 and 80 are, or outside of 20 and 80 are very rare. But this is a very powerful thing. And you can track, you can then compare that to the actual movement of, uh, in this case, the uh, S&P 500. And what you're watching for here are divergences. The divergences in a bullish percent and its underlying index could be a very strong uh, indication of an upcoming correction. And we see that here towards the end of the uh, 1990s, uh, where they, we had the internet bubble. Uh, and what this chart shows, if you take some time to study it, is it shows the bullish percent index was giving clear signals that things needed to move lower. And it did that several months ahead of, almost to a year ahead of when the market actually did collapse. So very, very interesting uh, set of, of warning signals coming out of the, BP, the BPI at that point. Now, we have many BPIs available on our site, not just the New York Stock Exchange one. 
and you see a list of them here. There may actually be a couple more beyond this list. Just type dollar BP into our charting box and you'll get the, uh, the drop down will contain all the different ones that we have. Uh, but we have them not only for the major indexes, but we also have them for the major sectors. And sector BPIs are really fun to play with. So those are some, uh, those are some things. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm a little out of time, so I'm just gonna keep going because uh, I wanna show you one more thing about uh, point and figure charts before we finish up the show. But I do encourage you to spend some time looking at dollar BP, blah, 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 uh, and check out what those uh, indicators might be telling you. All right. So the final thing I wanted to talk about while we have a little, ex little time left is scanning and how point and figure charts come into play with, the, with our scan engine. We have, um, again, the ability on a point and figure chart to automatically detect patterns. And that's really powerful. We don't have that or we don't have that quite as clearly on a bar or candlestick chart, but we do have it on point and figure charts. And so that's really nice. Now, I did another deep dive on scanning earlier. If you need to go back and review that one, you can find it in our YouTube channel. But um, I'm going to assume that you're kind of a little familiar with how our scanning works. Here's what a scan looks like. Don't, don't be scared. <laughs> There's a little math involved, but it's nothing big. It's just some greater than or less thans and the word and. Pretty straightforward, frankly. So, so here's an example of, fine, of a scan that's going to find stocks with a P&F triple top breakout. So... The first three lines, don't worry about. It. Those are just standard lines. Um, the second line is kind of interesting. It's just saying, I don't want any stock whose price is less than five. Um, it's the th fourth line, the final line, that's the interesting one where we've added, and today's triple top breakout is true. So that means that today the stock has a triple top breakout on its chart. And so it'd be nice to see all of those, wouldn't it? And so we can run that scan and we, can find, and we will get back a list, but there's a problem. The list we get back of stocks with triple top breakouts doesn't necessarily mean that they've had a, triple to, a new triple top breakout as of today. It means that the current pattern on the chart is a triple top breakout, but that pattern might have existed for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, even a couple of years if the stock hasn't really done anything else. So if the stock isn't very volatile, a pattern can exist on the PNF chart for many for a long period of time. So we need to be more specific in our scan so that we get the more recent stuff. So we can do that using this approach. So this approach finds new PNF triple top breakouts. So everything, the first four lines are exactly the same as what we saw before. We've added a fifth line. And the fifth line says, and yesterday's triple top breakout is false. So it did not have a triple top breakout yesterday, but it did have a triple top breakout today. That's what the scan is going to look for. And that, by definition, is are going to be um, stocks that have new triple top breakouts. So it's going to be a much smaller list, obviously, but it will be a more interesting list because those are the stocks we might be interested in, in researching or in potentially buying. So this is the approach that you want to use when searching for any, really, any um, uh, P&F chart pattern. Um, here's another one you can use if you want to find stocks in an uptrend. Um, and that's, this could actually be used regardless of if you're a P&F expert or not. You just want to find stocks in an uptrend. Then you can say, and P&F chart in X's is true. So that, that phrase, P&F chart in X's, is going to either be false or true depending on the last column of the chart. If the last column of the chart contains an X, then it's true. If the last column of the chart doesn't, then it's false if it, if it contains a no. And again, by definition, if it contains an X, that means it's in an uptrend. And so that's that can be a useful bit of information. You can then add additional clauses above and beyond this in your scan. So let's say you wanted to scan, again, for not a, not a P&F thing, you wanted to scan for, say, a MACD, uh, a MACD crossover, but you want to make sure that the stocks are in an uptrend. Well, you could add this final clause here, PNF chart in, in X's is true, and then you would do your MACD crossover clause after that. So that's really, really nice. Um, uh, again, the, if you do it by itself, that's going to give you a ton of results, which isn't impressive, but you can then do additional things uh, to clarify it. Now, another additional thing you could do, let's say, 
I, I gave you the MACD example, but let's say you want to, you're more PNF oriented, which is great. You can also do something like this, PNF box count greater than 20. So that would find stocks that have more than 20 X's in their final column. And that would mean they've been in an uptrend for quite some time, an impressive amount of time actually. And so that's a really, really powerful scan there. You could take 20 and, and, and carve it down to 10 if you wanted or, or make it up to 30, however you, wanted, however you want to customize it is fine. These, basically you would take this expression, cut and paste it into our advanced scan workbench and then be able to run the scan. All right, so we're down to the wire, I think. Um, I'm, I'm kind of um, left the final couple of minutes open for some questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have one question that actually would be kind of interesting. Your analysis on a, the S&P chart and explain how, how you're reading the PNF when you just look at that chart. Okay, so I'm gonna go back over to my demo machine and I am going to just type in for my, I've got a PNF chart up now with the settings I like, so I'm just gonna type in the S&P 500 symbol, which is dollar SPX. Mm -hmm. Press enter, stand back. Mm -hmm. So like, what are you looking for when you look at that right. PNF chart? So this is a traditional, um, P or using traditional scaling. And by the way, traditional scaling kind of breaks down when you get really large numbers. It also breaks down when you get really small numbers. So I'm a little concerned about that. Notice that my, um, my columns of X's and O's get very short um, here. I might wanna change this to a different scaling method to get larger columns of X's and O's. But anyway, what I see right now, just leaving it as is, what I see right now is that currently the S&P 500 is in a rising column of X's. It's got four, and the last one was filled in during October. That's why the A is at the very top of this. I also see that seven, eight, and nine are fairly close together. So that means that there hasn't been a lot of volatility, at least with given this, these box sizes. And the box size right now we can see from the side is 50. So each box represents 50 points. There hasn't been a lot of volatility uh, with that box size uh, over the past year. We can actually go back to February and it's still all pretty close. So this would indicate to me the PNF that the uh, S&P 500 has been moving sideways. Now, all in all, it's still above the last trend line that we drew, which is this blue trend line down at the bottom. It's very, very much above that blue trend line. So all in all, it's still in a very long-term uptrend. It did have a big breakdown, I guess, in December. I can see the C from 2018 here and the one from January here. So in December, had that big breakdown and recovery, uh, and then some more volatility but since then has been rising. Notice also that uh, during 2018, it was kind of in this box going horizontally. And then in 2019, it's in a box that's going up at 45 degrees. So this is actually, if we see, there's an X here where the five is, there's an X here where the seven is, there's an X here where the A is. If this A goes to the next column, that's gonna be an ascending triple top breakout which is not super, um, not, those are kind of rare. So that would be really, that would be really amazing. But, but definitely we see not only a, a kind of a consolidation here, but it's a consolidation with that upward 45 minute uh, or 45 degree kind of trend going on. And we're getting ready possibly to set that um, new thing. It would have to move above um, 3150. I believe it has to move above 3150 in order for this particular box to be filled. We can see that it has moved above 3,000 and it's at 30.93 to, and that filled the box with the A in it. To get above the next box, we'd have to go above 31.50. The, the numbers on a PNF chart represent the line below the number. So 3,100 represents the line below, that's below the 3,100. Anyway, so just quickly and then, so it says, um, it's got this ascending triple top breakout it, that it's trying to establish in, on October 30th. I would say actually that's there, but it hasn't really broken out. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, all right, well, we're out of time again. I love these deep dive shows. And by the way, I love doing them from, this, from the cafe. This is tons of fun. But we will see you next time. I hope, I hope this show's been useful. Talk to you later.